I think we're good to go. I'm going to send us live now, everyone. Okay. Have a great yeah. webinar. Thank you. Thank you. We'll try. Bye. Hi everyone and welcome to Heart to Heart, a webinar on heart valve disease, how to manage it um, and it's a collaboration between Hearts for Heart and the Baker Institute and proudly supported by Edward Life Sciences. So we'd like to begin with acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are recording today, the Wurundjeri of the Kula Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So this week marks Australia's second annual Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week, a Hearts for Heart initiative developed to raise awareness about a common but undetected condition, uh, but often undetected condition, uh, that can lead to serious complications if not properly managed. So I'm Tanya Hall, the CEO and founder of, of charity Hearts for Heart, and joining me today for this important discussion about heart valve disease will be Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute Director Professor Tom Marwick, and Phil Holmes, who was diagnosed with heart valve disease in 2019. So during this one hour webinar, we'll discuss how heart valve disease occurs, what common symptoms are, who's at risk, and how to prevent it. We'll also talk about what it's like to live with heart valve disease and share evidence-based management strategies for best health outcomes. We'll be answering questions pre-submitted by some of you when you register to join us today, and I'll be checking my phone for questions that come through the chat box. So to set the scene, we'd like to share a short and very informative video about heart valve disease. You know what a stroke is. You know about heart attacks. But have you ever heard of heart valve disease? Valves are like doors inside the heart. They open and close to allow blood to get to where it needs to go. As we age, the stress on our valves increases and this can lead to heart valve disease. Complications of heart valve disease can be serious. 
heart failure, strokes, blood clots, even death. The good news is heart valve disease is often treatable and can be detected by a doctor listening to your heart. In Australia, heart valve disease is on the rise. More than a quarter of a million Australians have heart valve disease and don't know it. Over 65? Ask your doctor to listen to your heart. It could save your life. It's so important for people to understand the signs and symptoms of heart valve disease as well as the factors that can increase their risk of developing the condition. But talking about your heart health can be a daunting task. It can, it can be confusing to navigate tricky questions about one's health, heart health or even initiate a conversation with loved ones um, and or healthcare professionals. So that, that's why we developed Heart to Heart, which is a simple and free game designed to encourage conversations about heart health in a fun and engaging way because a small conversation can go a long way. It's a great resource for individuals, families and communities to learn more about heart health and how to manage uh, and prevent heart valve disease. And we're going to be using this game today to guide our conversation with Tom and Phil to illustrate just how easy it is. So, in terms of what it looks like. So to get started, I'd like to introduce Professor Tom Marwick, a renowned cardiologist and researcher with extensive experience in both Australia and the USA, who brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the field with over a thousand publications numerous awards and grants and a passion for early detection and cost-effective application of cardiac imaging techniques. Tom currently serves as the director of Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. So welcome, Tom. Thanks, Tanya. Great to be here. So look, let's get start, started with some heart trivia. Um, we saw in the video that people over the age of 65 are at increased risk of de developing heart valve disease. So Tom, is aging the only cause of heart valve disease? No, it's not the only cause, but it is really very important. It's led to this increment of heart valve disease that we're seeing at the moment. But the other things that can cause it are genetics, some heart valve diseases inherited, and also infection. So particularly in the Aboriginal community, still a high prevalence of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart valve disease. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, Tom, um, my second question is, um, what are the signs and symptoms of heart valve disease? Well, they can be very nonspecific. I think this is part of the problem, Tanya, um, that, you know, people feel as though they're getting a bit weary or, or and they often attribute them to old, to old age or get, getting older. The specific ones are shortness of breath or discomfort or chest pain with activity or sometimes faintness. There are symptoms that go with heart failure, such as congestion in the, in the lungs or in the legs. But fundamentally, this is a slowly developing disease and the symptoms can be insidious. And hence the importance about knowing about it and having a conversation with general practitioner. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see so often that these symptoms are often um, missed or uh, dismissed as just getting older or working too hard. Um, so it's really, I totally agree, it's so important that we um, recognise these symptoms and go and, and see a GP to get a heart check. But um, if I was experiencing any of these question, um, symptoms and went to my doctor, how would he or she uh, check for heart valve disease? Well, look, the first is a, is a careful history because some things that are meaningful to clinicians are not necessarily meaningful to patients. So uh, the time a particular activity has taken in the past compared to what it's taking at the moment. But fundamentally, the physical examination is, is really important. Just the, you know, the good old stethoscope and you know, listening to the heart is, is really a critical part of this. And unfortunately, um, often people are in a hurry um, and, and you know, patients and doctors and the process of uncovering and so on takes time. But listening is really important for picking up heart valve lesions because the symptoms may not lead you to the right diagnosis on their own. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as you know, Tom, stethoscope checks are not uh, a standard part of the heart health check. And so it's so important to request this be done when speaking to your GP. Um, Hearts for Heart and the Baker Institute, along with other stakeholders working to support heart health, are advocating that a stethoscope check be included in the heart health check. 
And you on the webinar um, who have joined us today can help us by visiting the Hearts for Heart website and signing our, peti our, our petition to government requesting this. Um, and the petition will be shared in the in the chat box, but it's essential and, and, and it will help us save lives. Um, so look, Tom, uh, this next question is a true or false. Is it true that there are no treatment options for heart valve disease? No, fortunately, that's extremely untrue. Uh, there definitely are treatment options. So most of the treatment options are actually interventions when the valve disease becomes significant enough to, to require an intervention. But certainly there are things that can be done in the meantime. The heart valve problem often occurs in conjunction with other things such as high blood pressure, and that can potentiate the heart valve problem. So um, treating blood pressure is important. Um, surveillance is important because as, as, as we've discussed already, this is something that's insidious. So keeping a track on it is really critical. And look, a healthy lifestyle is very important. There's some aspects of heart valve disease that are very similar to to arterial disease. And so high blood cholesterol, uncontrolled sugars in diabetes, poorly controlled hypertension, all of these things are drivers of the progression of disease. So there's lots of things that can be done to, to try and control the progression, but fundamentally, and I think most importantly, um, it's possible to do interventions to solve the problem uh, in a way that those interventions were much more challenging in years past. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Um, and. I think, you know, that will certainly be a, a great relief for many of our audience members today. Um, can you share, I know you've sort of briefly touched on it, but can you share three ways someone with heart valve disease can manage their condition? Well, look, the, the, the first thing, obviously, is to have the problem identified. And so that's part of that is the, the regular attendance at, at a GP and then follow up if there is a heart valve lesion. So um, these this is a problem that progresses. It's a chronic disease and it's not going to go away. It's probably going to progress at some speed. And so um, follow-up is important. So that's probably the number one thing. Um, the second thing is the treatment of, of cardiovascular risk factors. So um, if you've got high blood pressure, there's evidence that poorly controlled blood pressure contributes to the progression of the disease. Um, so that is important as well. And then when the opportunity comes for an intervention, it's important um, that that happens in a timely way. And sometimes I have discussions with, with my patients about the timing of heart valve interventions. And obviously nobody wants to go for an, an unnecessary intervention, but there are times that we identify deterioration of cardiac function. People still feel okay, but that's the time to strike before people are, are developing severe symptoms and, and long-term cardiac damage. So all of those things. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. And is there anything else that you'd like to add before we move on to a conversation with Bill and then the Q&A? Um, for example, uh, the, you know, briefly chat about the key research projects or um, perhaps the need to advocate for a Seth Stroke heart check? Well, look, I think all those things are important. I think that, uh, you know, the work that we at Baker have done over the last few years looking at the prevalence of this problem in the community, as you saw in that movie to begin with, there's probably about half a million people in Australia with heart valve disease and about half of them don't know that they have it. So the process of recognition is important. As a clinician, um, I would quite commonly see somebody who's elderly, probably has had non-specific symptoms for a while, turns up to the hospital in a crisis. This is more particularly with aortic valve disease. Um, and really that crisis is unnecessary. Uh, and it, you know, it takes time and sometimes very challenging to get people out of that crisis. Uh, and fundamentally, that's what motivates me uh, about this process here, that, that we can improve the outcomes of people with heart valve disease if the detection is more effective. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. I mean, the work that you're doing is just incredible. And I think, you know, it just, it just goes back to the key message about this Awareness Week, you know, we really want people to be identifying symptoms early and to go and get their heart check. And that's essentially, um, you know, it'll it, that that's what assists with improving patient outcomes. Um, so look, oh, sorry. Precisely. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So look, now I'd like to shift gears and introduce you to someone who has firsthand experience of what it's like to live with heart valve disease. Um, and living proof that it's indeed possible to live with heart valve disease. Bill Holmes is also joining us from Melbourne, recently retired. Bill is a proud father 
um, of three and grandfather of five, who was overcoming a who who after overcoming a health scare in 2019 related to heart valve disease, is now, is now a strong advocate for regular health checkups um, and the importance of a supportive network and exploring all treatment options. Welcome to you, Phil. Thanks, Tanya. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, yeah, 2019 was the year that I was diagnosed with um, serious uh, heart valve disease, but it was also a big year for me. It was the year I was turning 70. Um, it was a year I was planning my retirement from the workforce. So it was a big year and we had a lot of celebrations planned for my, my 70th. Um, I must add that it was pre-COVID. Um, I was working full time, traveling uh, interstate quite a lot. Um, I had a very, um, a very uh, responsible role as an executive with an icon, uh, an Australian icon brand. Um, I was previous, the, the previous six years, I guess I'd become somewhat of a gym junkie. So I was going to the gym five days a week. Um, I was very conscious of my fitness. Uh, my day started at 3.15 a.m. where I'd get up in the morning, I'd be in the gym at four, I'd work out for two hours. Um, and two days a week, I do a CrossFit class. Then I head off to work and, and put in a long day at, uh, at work. Um, during, in uh, July of 2019, the gym buddies and I, we decided we would support men's mental health and we would undertake the push-up challenge. And that was, I think, 3,128 push-ups in 21 days. And for those with good mass, that's about 149 push-ups a day. Um, we decided we'd push ourselves to 4,000 push-ups in the 21 days. In the first week, um, I was fine. I was doing two, 400 push-ups a day, um, no problem at all, uh, felt great. Um, in the second week, got to Wednesday and I started and something that Tom touched on. I started to feel fatigued, um, started to get breathless. Um, I put it down to maybe just push myself a bit too hard, but I didn't feel well, but I didn't have chest pains or, or other symptoms. I just didn't feel well. Um, and I pushed through um, the following week. I got to Tuesday and it was like, I was, I can't do this. Um, I'm so fatigued. I'm breathless. When I stopped exercising, I was breathing fine. I, you know, I, I, I just felt tired. I felt worn out. Um, and I knew something wasn't right. Knowing my body the way I did, knowing what I was capable of, I knew something wasn't right. So being a, a male, I don't normally go to the GP, typical male. I go to the GP once a year, get a flu shot, normally from the nurse, so I never see the GP. Um, so for me, it was um, <clears throat> go and see the GP. I explained that, uh, what I was feeling. Um, he actually listened to my heart with a stethoscope, like, like Tom demonstrated, and told me that I had a very noisy valve. Um, I was quite ignorant at the time. I didn't even know to ask the question, what valve, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I then arranged to see um, a cardiologist, Tony Walton. Um, and before I could see Tony, they asked me to have an echo sound. I had the echo sound. I remember the lady doing the echo sound um, had quite a concerned look on her face. And she actually said to me, when are you seeing uh, Tony? And I said, next week. She said, I'm really glad you're seeing him next week. And it sort of rang an alarm bell in, in my head. Um, and I saw Tony the following week um, where he told me that I had serious uh, aortic stenosis and that my valve was in a very bad way. Um, naturally, I was completely shocked. I mean, I was 100 foot tall, I was bulletproof, um, I was fit, I was doing everything right, my weight was right. Um, and to be told that I had serious heart condition um, was an absolute shock, it, it floored me totally. Um, I was given uh, very generously a walkthrough of what my options were. Um, and I had the option of open heart surgery or TAVI. Um, to me, given my lifestyle and what I wanted, um, the open heart surgery wasn't attractive to me. Um, so I went for the TAVI. I had my TAVI um, in uh, September 2019. And I can honestly say to everyone on this call, I've never looked back. It's the best thing I could have ever have done. Um, I also know that um, if I hadn't have had the TAVI, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I would not be here. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, so uh after the tabby i was back at work within a few days um, i was back in the gym in four weeks um, i've now retired uh, i play golf three days a week i walk the course i go to the gym still three or four days a week i've got a large rural property which keeps me busy um, and i'm leading a very normal active physical life mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and i feel great
That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Phil. And I think so many others on the call today, I'm sure, will have experienced a very similar journey. And, you know, and I think it just goes back to the importance of why it's so important, right, to go and get your heart checked um, because once you have access to the treatment and in particular, you know, as you say, Tavi, I mean, it's incredible, the patients I've spoken to. Um, it is amazing. It, yeah, it really, I, I can't speak highly enough of that procedure. Um, yeah. And, I, and I, I think, you know, the, the, the skill that people like Tom have um, is amazing and it gives people like me a second chance. Um, and, and I grab that second chance with both hands and I've run with it. Yeah, absolutely. I see that Tom's got his hand up there. I, I just, I, I just like for people that are unfamiliar to explain what a tabby is. Oh, sorry. So this is a, a, a percutaneous. In other words, it's through the skin and through the arteries. It, um, uh, aortic valve replacement. So instead of opening the chest, um, mm. the, the, the device is delivered through the arteries. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. I mean, it's incredible. You know, patients I've spoken to, they say I've been feeling very one and well one day. Literally the next day, you know, feel so much better. Um, Absolutely. For patients, so Fully yeah, no, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Phil, I have another question for you from the mm -hmm. from the deck. Um, yep. Deep down, was there anything about your heart health that you were concerned about or were too um, afraid to ask your doctor at the time? That's a really good question, um, Tanya. And something I do want to share is that um, when I was given the news, as I said, it came as a tremendous shock to me, um, and I actually got really depressed. Um, like really depressed um, and I didn't discuss it with anyone and I remember Tony Walton and my cardiologist asked me was I okay did I have any questions how was I feeling I remember laying on the trolley waiting to go into the cath lab uh, to have my procedure and he came up and said are you okay and I, I said yes I was but I really wasn't um, I actually thought that I, I wouldn't get through this um, and I, I realized later that it was so wrong of me not to express my concerns um, and to share the fact that I was depressed. Um, and I think that being a male, we tend to hold that in and, and we really shouldn't. Um, the only other th question I had, I guess, was how long does the valve last was the one question that I had. Um, and at that stage, there was no definitive because Tabby was relatively new. So um, although it was the same valve, I understand it was being used in, in open heart surgery. So the expectation was, you know, 20, 25 years, the valve, the valve would last. Um, uh, that, they were the main things I was worried about. But as I said, depression was the big thing that I should have dealt with a lot differently. And I, anyone that's got heart valve disease, if you, if you do get depressed, please bring it out and talk to people about it because that's something I should have done. I didn't do it. Thank you for, you know, being so open. Um, you know, I think so many people who go through this type of experience do um, experience depression and, and you're absolutely right. It's really important that we that we talk about it, that we reach out for help. Um, so we really appreciate you being so open. That's fine. Thank you, Phil. Um, and look, uh, so on to my, my next question. Um, mm -hmm. Have you set any goals for improving your heart health uh, that you haven't achieved? And if so, can you share some of the barriers that you feel that got in the way of success? Um, no, not not really, Tanya. I mean, I think um, we all know that you know, I live in Melbourne. Uh, we were the most locked down state um, in the, probably in the world. Um, uh, so fitness suffered a little bit. Um, I wanted to, you know, get back into the gym, but the gyms were closed. I couldn't do that. Couldn't go more than five kilometres from home. So that restricted me a little bit in, in what I wanted to do. Um, I've always wanted to be, you know, always want to be 10% fitter. I always want to be three kilos lighter. Uh, but no, there's no real goals I haven't achieved. Um, I'm very conscious of my diet. Um, I'm very conscious that I exercise properly. Um, I, I, I sleep well. Um, just the normal things that I should be doing to manage my heart, my heart, uh, heart valve disease. That's fantastic. I think you're a very good role model for us uh, heart heart patients. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for sharing your story. I, you know, it's, it's really appreciated. No, my pleasure. So, look, now I'm going to invite our bite bill to stay on and Tom to rejoin us as we'd like to answer some questions um, from our audience. Uh, so, the the first question is from Alan. And which is, I was born with a bicuspid aorta valve, which was replaced with a porcine valve. This valve then became infected and was replaced with a me mechanical valve. 
I now have a pacemaker because the operations had affected my heart ele electrical system. My heart is strong and becoming less dependent on the pacemaker. I'm 71 years old, active and in good health. A, bi a bicuspid valve's rare and what is likely to happen in my future? So I think this is probably a question for Tom. Yeah, so thanks, Tanya. So bicuspid valves are the commonest congenital abnormality. So people are born with them. Um, they're present in about 1% to 2% of the population. Um, they often travel in families. So if somebody has a bicuspid aortic valve identified, then family members should be screened. They're, they're often not um, because the return of screening is low, but it is still, a, it's a very important thing to do. Um, look, I, I think what Alan's describing there is, is not unusual in people who've had chronic heart valve disease. Um, the, the heart valves are great. They've improved substantially over previous decades, but they're not perfect. They can get infected and they can, and reoperations can be needed. And again, it goes back into the topic of surveillance. If you have heart valve disease, if you're being followed, then it's likely that these things will be picked up before they turn into a crisis. So finally, to, to, to finish with that, um, uh, mechanical valves are very durable. They have the disadvantage of requiring warfarin, a blood thinner, which has problems of its own, um, but they are very, very durable. So they can go for decades and decades without having problems. One of the things that I think is really important in people with chronic heart valve disease, once they get into the 70s and 80s, is just dealing with the other cardiovascular things that happen. So the heart valve disease produces some stress on the rest of the heart. And so treating blood pressure and treating risk factors is a really important thing to do as well as monitoring the valve disease. Thank you, Tom. Look, we've had a few questions about life expectancy. Um, and this question is from Faisal. Can you talk to life expectancy post heart valve replacement in high risk patients? Is surgery still a better option or is it safer to consider lifestyle and pharmaceutical management as the preferable choice for high risk patients? Yeah, look, it really depends on what is what is causing that person to be high risk. So if they're high risk because of other uh, other illnesses, say chronic lung disease or something like that, then then, you know, that would, in fact, be a driver towards doing a, a, a percutaneous valve like what Phil had, a, a tabby, if it's an aortic. And we are in the course of, of um, uh, starting to put in these percutaneous valves into the mitral position and various other um, procedures for the tricuspid valve and, and also in the pulmonic valve as well. So um, it, it's something that is very uh, personalized. It depends on the other things that are going on. But in general, in general, and this is in general, um, it's not so much the valve that is the issue in long-term follow-up, but the consequences of the valve problem on the heart. So something of heart valve problem that's been untreated for a long period of time may have sustained damage to the pump function of the heart, and that may require medicines, and in fact, may be the source of the ongoing medical problems for that person after their valve has been fixed. So if anything, that is the most more common scenario. Excellent, thank you. Now, this is a question about how long valves will last. Um, Kay has asked, how long can I expect my TAVI, in, uh, my TAVI inserted in 2020 to function effectively? And June has also asked, how long does a pig valve last? She had a, a pig valve put in 12 years ago. Yeah. So um, basically there are two different classes of valves. One is a mechanical valve. Um, and as I've mentioned, that requires blood thinning. Uh, it's the best option for young people, um, uh, but for people of middle age and older, tissue valves are, are the best option. So tissue valves come from animals. They're effectively, they're, they're not like a transplant because the tissue has been treated. It's a kind of like leather. Um, but because they're a biological system, you know, they're not, they're not perfect. So there's an element of, of unpredictability and, and aging and wear and tear on those valves. I think with a tissue valve, you can expect to have at least 10 years. Um, 15 to 20 years is certainly possible. There are people that have had, had surgically implanted tissue valves over 20 years. The, the important thing is the follow-up. 
Now, as Phil alluded to, the, the number of years that we'll be putting TAVIs in has limited our, uh, our follow-up so far in people with, with TAVIs. They look as though they're the same as any other tissue valve. Mm. But the really encouraging thing about TAVIs is that once the valve wears down, it is possible to replace it with another TAVI. In other words, the valve can be situated within the valve that's, that's become um, you know, narrowed or, or damaged in some way with the passage of time. So in the, in the past, in decades previously, we would have to do you know, multiple chest surgeries to replace valves, but that is something of the past now in most cases. Yep. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Tom. So the next two questions are about diet, exercise and lifestyle. Marjorie has asked, I had a aortic valve replacement last November and hear my heart beating louder now. Is this normal? I was hoping to have more energy, but no, but so far, no difference. Yeah, well, I, look, I mean, the thing is that, um, that the causes of fatigue and loss of energy are multiple. And um, of course, the valve is an important contributor to that, but may not be the only driver. So for that reason, you know, we think that cardiac rehabilitation is very important after valve procedures, um, just as it is after other cardiac problems such as heart attacks or, or bypass surgery. Um, interestingly, fewer than half the people that should go for rehab go to rehab in Australia. So it's, a, it's a, in many instances a, an issue of rebuilding back fitness over a period where fitness has been compromised. I guess the second point I'd make is that is that often after the valve has been fixed, that's you know fix the fix the uh, the problem with the flow of blood. But if the valve has been fixed late in the course of the disease, there may be some consequences on the ventricle. And um, what I think Marjorie's describing there may relate to the effects of increased workload on the ventricle and therefore some stiffness of the ventricle that makes it a bit more difficult to fill with blood. People can have troubles with fatigue and shortness of breath. These are fixable symptoms. And again, it goes back to the issue of surveillance and follow-up. Um, these things are, are fixable, but often it takes time and it takes trying multiple, into, multiple treatments and so on. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. And I think, you know, we're all individual, aren't we? So I think each person needs to yeah. be, have a different kind of management plan. Yeah. Um, and look, Simone has asked, I have type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, obstructive sleep, apnea, high cholesterol, polycystic ovarian system syndrome, sorry, and stress tachycardia. What is the best diet to follow and type of exercise? Well, you know, we could spend an entire webinar talking about diet and exercise. Um, look, the strongest evidence is for a so-called Mediterranean diet um, that has been tested in randomized trials, which is the best means of gathering evidence that we can gather. Um, uh, look, I think one of the things I say to my patients is that when you're shopping, you need to count the number of things that come packaged. And if there's a lot of things that are packaged, that's processed food and you, know, you can do better than that. So um, uh, dealing with unprocessed food is important. And then all of the things that you expect in a Mediterranean diet, um, the use of olive oil, um, fruits, legumes, nuts and seeds. Um, uh, you know, in other words, it, it, it's a, a number of dietary components um, that people in a standard Western diet don't consume. And, and I think it's, it's how humans were designed to eat, if you like. Um, so the short answer to that is, if you're not familiar with the Mediterranean diet, go online and there's, there's quite a number of papers written about it uh, and try and emulate that. Um, just in passing, I would say that although pizza comes from Italy, it's not part of the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That's really good advice. I particularly like, um, you know, just it's very simple, but just looking in your trolley to see what's packaged, I think it's really, yeah. you know, that really yeah. simplifies things, yeah. doesn't it? Um, now, Phil, can you tell us a little bit about your personal experience? Have, uh, how have your energy levels been? And can you also tell us about your diet um, and exercise choices post heart valve replacement? Sure. Thank you, Tanya. Um, firstly, energy levels are, are, are really good. I mean, they're back to where I was before I was diagnosed. Um, 
as I said, I'm playing golf three days a week. I'm still in the gym. Uh, I still do a lot of work around the property. I have no problem with energy at all. And very much like Tom said, I'm very conscious of my diet, uh, a very low fat diet. I follow the Mediterranean uh, train. Um, I certainly don't eat any junk food uh, at all. Um, you, know, you may have your occasional breakout um, and that's not, that's not bad. It's not a bad thing. Um, but I certainly am very conscious about what I eat. We eat a lot of fresh vegetables, a lot of fruit, um, a lot of nuts uh, and seeds. And uh, I'm very big on, you know, the, the chickpea type um, salads and, and what have you. So it's it's around just trying to balance. I try and balance everything out. I don't eat a lot of red meat. Um, and that's only, that's a preference to me. I prefer to eat chicken or, or fish. Um, but I'm very conscious of um, what I'm putting in my mouth. I have a saying with people now is that we worry so much about how we look on the outside. We actually can't see what's on inside and we should be more worried about what's inside than how we look on the outside. And, and that's the way I look at life now. Before I was worried about, you know, did I have a nice tight tummy? Did I have muscles? I don't worry about that now. I worry about what's going on inside my body. Yeah, absolutely. And good for you. Rightly so. I think, unfortunately, sometimes it takes for us to sometimes uh, have these types of experiences to absolutely. kind of shift our way of thinking. But, yeah, yeah. you know. And can I, I just add, my wife's just turned 60 and she's having her first stress test in Echo Sound in a couple of weeks um, because she's she's taking my, my advice and say, you turn 60, go and get your heart listened to, please. Good on you. Well, fingers crossed everything's okay. Sure, she'll be fine. So, Phil, I'm going to throw the next question to you mm -hmm. too. Um, mm -hmm. So Eric wants to know what are the recommendations for, for continuing monitoring um, and can you talk about what you do to continually continually monitor your health? Yeah, sure. I'll look, um, I'm uh, obviously see my cardiologist uh, every 12 months. Um, I have a uh, echo sound before I see him. Um, and uh, fortunately, I get a clean bill of health. I saw Tony uh, in December and got a very clean bill of health. I see. I go and check. Uh, I check in with my GP once a quarter. Um, I get my blood pressure checked. Um, I get him to listen to my heart, even though I've had a clean bill of health from Tony. I have that follow up. Um, and um, uh, and uh, really, I, I I'm very conscious now that if if I don't feel well, I go to the doctor. I'm not being a typical male anymore that doesn't go to the doesn't go to the doctor. Um, and um, I think it's just about how are you feeling? I just, you know, if I know when something's wrong now and I act on it. Fantastic. That's great. Great advice. Um, and Tom, I realise you talked about this earlier, but is there anything more that you'd like to add to this? No, look, I think with people with heart valve disease, you know, whether it's before or after an intervention, it is, it's important that this is kept under surveillance. And in some circumstances, the GP is fine to do it. And in some circumstances, it's the cardiologist. It depends what other things are going on and where people are in that course. Um, but, you know, it has to be somebody who's interested. And as Phil rightly said, you know, oftentimes it's an issue of listening in. You can have an echo done last week and, you know, next week you can develop a Absolutely. an infection on a heart valve or, or one yep. of the cusps starts, starts misbehaving and so if you you know if even if you had a normal echo or if you feel a bit short of breath or things aren't quite the same and it's it's a matter of, of recognizing the symptoms of what is a chronic yep. disease it's a chronic very manageable disease that that's that's yep. the thing that is frustrating when people get into into trouble with this it, it's it's a lot of these things I would say almost all of them are fixable, but yeah. fixable in good time. Absolutely. Sorry, Tony, the other, sorry, Tony, the other thing I forgot to mention was I also have my bloods done every six months. So I, I have all my, so I monitor my cholesterol, uh, but I get all my bloods done every six months. That's great, Phil. Um, so look, lots of people have submitted questions to see if what they have is a form of heart valve disease. Tom, can you answer a few of these? Um, Joy wants to know is, um, sorry, Josephine wants to know, is a leaky valve a heart valve disease? So a, a leaky valve probably is a heart valve disease. Um, the valves are not designed to leak. The valves are, are, are like a door. So when the door is closed, there shouldn't be anything going through it. Um, to identify a leaky valve, 
there's a need to listen. And when we listen, we hear the sound of, of blood, turbulent blood, um, going at a time that it shouldn't across the valve. That produces a sound called a murmur. It can be a sort of whooshing sound or a higher pitched sound. It depends which heart valve is involved. And the next step after, after that is identified is an echocardiogram uh, or an ultrasound test of the heart. And in the course of that, um, we are looking at the structure of the valves and also uh, the flow of blood across the valves and whether they're leaking. And so the actual recognition of leakage is done from an echo. Now, you can have a leaky valve and not need to have a heart valve intervention. But if you've got a leaky valve, then somebody needs to be following up on it. Because the natural history of a leaky valve is that probably it is going to get worse. It may take 10 years to get worse, but probably it's going to get worse. And mm -hmm. if left alone, um, then the leak can end up producing an extra load on the, on the pump of the heart because the pump, pump's dealing with what it needs to to get the blood going forward, plus the stuff that is leaking into it. So it's, again, a matter of recognition and surveillance. Thank you, Tom. So Roy has a question. Um, is a noisy heart, is a noisy heart valve heart valve disease? Uh, yeah, again, it depends on, on how the noise is detected, but if, if it's audible through a stethoscope, um, then, then probably it is a marker of heart valve disease. Not always, not 100%. Sometimes um, people where the circulation is a bit more active than others, um, you know, they may be a bit anxious when they see the doc or whatever. Um, you can get a murmur just from more blood flowing across parts of the heart. So a murmur doesn't necessarily mean that there's a valve problem needs to be fixed, but it does mean uh, usually that an echo test needs to be done to figure out what's causing the murmur. Sure. And how about correlating diseases, Tom? For example, Dave wants to know, is heart valve disease connected to hyper, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a specific disease entity. Um, uh, very commonly inherited, um, where there's some thickening of the heart muscle and that limits the ability of the heart to fill and can also limit the ability of the heart to empty during contraction. That is often associated with leakage through the mitral valve. Um, it may not necessarily be an intrinsic mitral valve problem. So it may just be because the mechanics of the heart aren't behaving as they should do, um, but it's something that may need to be assessed on its own merits. And so when we follow up people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we uh, check into the status of the mitral valve and examine it very carefully to see if it needs treatment in its own right. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. And Benjamin has asked, is heart valve disease connected to atrial fibrillation? Well, yes, it's a really good question, a very important one. So it is connected to atrial fibrillation. Um, atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm that is a very common problem in our community, um, probably involving a couple of percent of the population and increasing with age. Now, it may occur in conjunction with heart valve disease just out of coincidence because um, they, they, uh, they can occur they can uh, both be present in the same person. But there are some situations where atrial fibrillation may be caused by the valve problem. And that's particularly with mitral valve disease. So especially when the mitral valve is leaking, it can stretch the atria, which is the priming chamber before behind the pump. And that stretched atrium can become irritable. And that's what generates the atrial fibrillation. Thank you. So Lolady, I hope I pronounced that uh, correctly, has a question about aspirin. Should people with heart valve disease be on regular aspirin? Yeah, very controversial question. Um, so the thought behind it is that um, uh, people with heart valve disease may have some damage to the covering of their valves or the other heart tissue. And so in theory, that could be the site of a, a blood clot. Um, in general, there are specific situations where we would want to use blood thinners, but we would use a stronger blood thinner than aspirin. So um, in general, the valve on its own is not a reason to use aspirin. Heart valve disease is commonly associated with coronary disease. They're both diseases of older people. And aspirin is really a mainstay of the management of coronary disease. So oftentimes people with heart valve disease are on aspirin, but it's not because of their valve disease, it's because of an associated problem. Thank you. 
So look, Queen has an interesting question about dust. Um, Queen says, I had a valve replacement and bypass of two blood veins 15 years ago. I suspect dust is, is the root of the problem as I lived in a house close to a four-lane um, ar arterial road on a steep gradient for 16 years. The World Health Organization studied into whether dust would be the cause of heart problems, but I never heard about their findings. What are your views on this? Yeah, I we think that dust is a very important contributor to, to heart disease. So the underlying mechanism is that small particles, so-called PM2.5 or smaller, um, can transit the lung tissue into the circulation. Um, obviously, when that happens, they can generate an inflammatory response. And inflammation is a very important driver of vascular disease in general. Um, the connection with heart valve disease from dust is not very strong. Um, but the connection with coronary disease is quite strong. So people with exposed to dust can develop coronary disease that can produce cardiac damage and cardiac damage um, for the reasons that I mentioned before in relation to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy question. If the heart mechanics are not normal, then the valves may leak. So it may be a secondary complication from dust. Right, fascinating. Thank you, Tom. So look, the most common question we've received is about genetics. For example, Geraldine has asked, my mother had an aortic valve replacement and two bypass, bypass grafts 12 years ago. She's 91 and doing well, but I want to know if this is likely to be hereditary. Yeah, a really important question because it gets into the issue about surveillance. Um, should you know people who are asymptomatic, you know, feel well, have no symptoms, and don't have a abnormal finding, should they have uh, an echocardiogram? I think the answer is there are specific scenarios when that's important. So if your mother's heart valve disease was related to a bicuspid aortic valve, the likelihood of, of inheritance is pretty high. And so um, uh, family members, as we mentioned earlier during this webinar, family members sh should be screened for bicuspid aortic valve disease. That being said, um, heart valve disease appearing in, this, in the 80s or 90s is more commonly age-related rather than due to bicuspid valve. So it's quite probable that your, your mother's heart valve disease was just related to aging. And in that case, there is no evidence that family members are more likely to develop the problem than other people of similar age. Thank you. So look, Noel wants to know, is open heart mitral valve repair surgery for 75% regurg regurgitation the most common approach? <laughs> well, it depends, right? Um, so like many things, it depends. So um, uh, there are some situations where we would try and sort out the mitral valve with, uh, for example, a clip procedure or something along those lines. It really depends on the exact mechanism of the leak. Uh, and so, you know, I think about uh, the management of heart valve disease in, in various stages. The first step is the recognition of symptoms or the, the, the routine check at the GP that identifies the problem. The second step is the performance of an echo that confirms the problem. And then importantly, gives us information about the mechanism. And, you know, we've spoken about different types of heart valve disease. They're not all the same. So some of them are repairable, some of them are not repairable and require a replacement. So I wish I could give you a specific answer, Noel, but without knowing the details of the actual mechanism of the valve, I, I, I can't. It is something that's very individualized. Sure, thank you, Tom. Now, this is the last question from the registration questions, and then we'll move to any uh, questions that we have in the chat box. But uh, Philippa also wants to know, does high intensity exercise prevent or promote heart valve disease? Yeah, really good question. So um, I think the answer overall is that um, doing exercise is a lot better for you than not doing exercise. That being said, um, people that do a heck of a lot of exercise, as in multiple marathons or Ironman or whatever, um, can develop cardiac damage. Whether that cardiac damage really turns into something meaningful is a matter of ongoing investigation. And we at the Baker are very interested in this. And one of our groups is looking into this in detail. The short answer to your question is that there is no strong link between high intensity exercise and heart valve disease at the moment. Um, there may be some adverse consequences of 
prolonged high intensity exercise, but it's probably more on the heart muscle chambers and perhaps on the heart rhythm in later life rather than on the heart valves. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a few minutes to answer a couple of questions from the chat box. Um, and this one is from Monica. What is a healthy heart rate when you exercise as a senior? Oh, that's a really good question. So again, it depends. It depends what medicines you're on. Um, generally speaking, um, one good means of understanding what your heart rate should be is that a a kind of good proxy for your maximum heart rate is 220 minus your age. So say you're 70, that means that your maximum heart rate is 150. So if you're exercising to a vigorous but not very vigorous level, you, you might be getting up to 75%. Of your of of 150, so you know we might be talking about 110, 120. That 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 would be that would be un, unremarkable. So it, I think it depends on your exact age, and it depends on what medications you're on. But generally speaking, when we're training people, we're trying to get the heart rate up to say 70 percent or 75 percent of predicted maximum. None of these things are exact. Everybody has their true individual maximum heart rate. So the equation I gave you is not doesn't apply to everybody, but it's a, a reasonable marker. Um, for those of you that are not exercising at the moment, don't jump on your bike and try and get up to 150 today. Um, so um, you, you don't need to have any specific testing before you start exercising an exercise program. But it is important to be sensible and start mm. slowly and build up over time. Um, but those would be the numbers that I would use. Great advice. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Now, this is a question from Joni for Phil. Mm -hmm. How has your heart condition impacted your daily routine and social life? Did it, affect, did it affect your personal relationships? And do you have any advice for others trying to manage a new diagnosis? A few in there. Um, yeah. Uh, well, firstly, um, no, it hasn't impacted um, what I do and, and, and how I live, how I exercise. Um, I continued working for two years after um, I had uh, my procedure. Um, I, uh, I've maintained a very healthy and active uh, life, so it hasn't impacted me um, in, uh, in any way from that point of view. What was the next part of the question, Tanya, sorry? Um, did it affect your personal relationships? No, not at all. I uh, had great support from my wife um, and, and family, uh, always have had. Um, so no, no impact on personal relationship uh, whatsoever. Excellent. And do you have advice for others trying to manage a new diagnosis? I mean, listen, listen to your listen to your cardiologist. I mean, for me, um, I, I hang off what Tony tells me. Um, I'm I'm conscious now to go to my GP. I mean, it's really about listening to what people are telling you and doing something about it. Um, you know, we're all typical males. We you know we don't go to doctors. We don't we don't get sick. Um, but we do. And uh, I think if you listen and take the advice of the experts like Tom, um, you can live a long and very healthy life post uh, heart, heart disease uh, diagnosis. Yeah, that's that's really great advice. Um, Tom's got his hand up. Yeah, I just want to add to the comment that Phil made before, which I think is a really important one. Um, heart valve disease is a chronic disease. And, and I think that there is a psychological adjustment to that. And I feel, think Phil described that very well, you know, with his description, your description of your depressive symptoms and so on. And I would really second Phil's comment about how important it is to recognize that and to talk to people about it. It is something that it's oftentimes just a matter of getting your head around it. I don't think it necessarily requires um, you know, medication or, or specific treatment for depression. It's an adjustment issue, if anything, if anything. Yep. But it is a really important part of managing a chronic disease is recognizing that. Because as you say, Phil, before we develop the chronic disease, we feel that we're bulletproof. Yep. yep. But no, we're not. Fully endorse that, Tom. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. It's great to hear you say that. And I think you know, it's important as a, you know, as a patient myself um, to understand that, you know, when we're in front of the clinicians, they have a very short amount of time to be able to spend with us, you know. So sometimes they may not discuss depression and, 
um, ways in which to sort of manage that. So it is, you know, it, but it is a real thing and it really is up to us to um, to reach out for help when we need it. Yeah, I think some of it is normalising it, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, um, you know, obviously I see people every day with this problem, but, you know, the first time it happens to you, it's the first time it's happened to you. And, yeah. and, and your response to it can be, you know, oh, my God, I feel depressed. You know, what's wrong with me? And, and I think mm-hmm. just somebody saying, look, this is the beginning of a chronic disease. There's an adjustment issue. Um, you know, I understand. And secondly, it's something we can deal with in X, Y, and Z. I, I think it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. It's normal. It's okay. It is, yep. you know, feel this way. Absolutely. absolutely. So now, look, I have a question from Susan. Um, where do you enter from for the TAVI? This one would be for you, Tom. So normally we would enter from the, the femoral artery, the artery in your groin. Um, there are other potential entry sites, but, but that would be the most common to use. Excellent. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And this is a question from Carmel. Do you recommend cardiac rehab for TAVI and valve surgery? This, that one would be for Tom. Yeah, so this is, you know, what I was alluding to before. I I think cardiac rehab is underused. I do recommend it widely. I I think that there's often a process of needing to build up again after the procedure, Um, especially if the symptoms have been unrecognized previously, people's exercise capacity may have attenuated. And, And it goes back to the issue of what we're talking about before, living with a chronic disease, having the education to understand what the symptoms mean and so on. So cardiac rehab is more than exercise. And so the answer is yes, I, I, I think we're underusing that. We at the Baker are very interested in this and we understand the challenges on people's time for getting to rehab. And there are various solutions that we're working on using mobile health, for example, using apps so that people can tune into the education sessions. They don't physically need to be here. And we have a means of getting an exercise physiologist to work with them at home. So there are lots of different ways of dealing with this but I think it's an important part of the equation. That's fantastic and Phil did you have cardiac rehab after your tabby? I certainly started it. Um, I was in a fortunate situation I'm not building myself up here that um, I was very fit um, when I was diagnosed um, and I, uh, I my advice from my cardiologist was to um, gently take myself back into that fitness level um, and, and back into my regime which I did um, so what was I, I undertook some rehabilitation. It wasn't a great lot, a great deal because I was in such good physical shape. And I think that's also helped me get through things a lot quicker than maybe some other people uh, do. Sure, absolutely. Okay, and this is an, a, a question from Amber. Is there any routine test screening for people in the younger demographic instead of waiting for symptoms? Good question. Yeah. It's having your heart listened to. Yeah, so if you have a family history or if you have any unusual symptoms or you're worried about your heart, um, just when you're seeing the doc, ask them to have a listen. It'll just take a couple of minutes um, and it is the first step to investigations. Now, if there's no murmur audible, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no heart valve disease there, but it is just a very simple screening step. It doesn't cost them. Absolutely. Okay, so this is the last question. From Jay, I had a heart attack seven years ago at the age of 70 and had a stent stent inserted in LAD and now 12 uh, 12 monthly cardiologist checkups with stethoscope. There was no damage at the time to the heart, but should I be having more specific checkups? Yeah, so this is not really a specific heart valve question, although sometimes it can be after after some coronary disease. Mm -hmm. Um, What we found after stent procedures is that people may develop other um, coronary problems in the future, but there's no evidence that doing a frequent stress test is is changes the natural history of that disease. So the tests that are important are blood tests to check on cholesterol. So we know that the lower that we drop the cholesterol, the less likely it is that the plaque will build up again and cause a new problem. So some testing is important, but it's the garden variety um, checking the lipids and making sure the disease is controlled um, rather than necessarily checking the, the plumbing, if you like. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to both of you, Tom and Phil. Um, and I do have a final question. What mm-hmm. advice do you have for others who are living with heart valve disease or who may be at risk for developing the condition? 
Bill, I'll let you start. I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Um, yeah, like I think um, for me, it's 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 taking care of yourself. It's listening to your body, uh, and don't put things off. If you don't feel right, go to your doctor. Um, ask them, please check my heart. Uh, I can't stress that enough to anyone. As Tom said, it's it's simple. It's a stethoscope. They can listen to your heart. A lot of GPs don't naturally do it, um, but don't be afraid to ask. Um, and if you you know the slightest uh, off feeling, go and deal with it. Um, it's 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 only a few minutes of your life to save your life to go and deal with it. Um, and if you if you have um, uh, you know heart valve disease, uh, eat well, uh, sleep well, and and exercise. You don't have to run marathons. Just go for a walk. Um, that, that's all I can. Uh, all I, all the advice I can give, Tanya. Thank you. Great I, advice, Bill. Thank you. I, I I would concur with that completely, and I'd add something to it, and that is that, um, as Phil said, probably more men than women, you know, ignore things um, in the belief that they'll go away. Um, I'm here to tell you that with heart valve disease, that generally doesn't happen. Um, and so, you know, the recognition that um, this is a fixable problem. It doesn't require your chest being open to fix it. Um, is something that should reassure people. Uh, you know, I think in the past, in particular, what I'd have conversations with, particularly people in older age groups, about reluctance to undergo surgery and so on. In many instances, surgeries we wouldn't even consider it. We would do a, a percutaneous valve replacement. So, recognition of the problem and then confronting the problem and dealing with it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, look, thank you both so very much. You know, I think it just goes back to what this Awareness Week is all about, right? And that's, you know, going to get your heart checked, the earlier you're diagnosed and, you know, the better chance you have and, you know, the better the clinical outcomes will be. So thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks, Anya. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, look, now I have a question for the audience and one more card to share from Level 3, Take Action Deck. So look, we really don't want you to put your heart health on hold. Um, what we're asking is for you to write down something you, that you've learned from this heart to heart webinar and share it with your family and friends on the social media platform of your choice with the hashtag heart, heart to heart 2023. Um, and be sure to download your free copy of the heart to heart game at the hearts for heart website. And we're sharing a few links in the chat, bo chat box for you now. So while you're on the website, check out our other resources and be sure to check out Baker Institute's website as well, where you'll find all sorts of information to support your support you in good heart health. So look, I hope you've all enjoyed today's discussion. You can rewatch this webinar when we send an email with a link to watch tomorrow. Um, and please feel free to share the link to watch with others and encourage them to be heart smart. If we were unable to get to your question today, please email your questions to info at heartsforheart.org.au and we'll get back to you with your answers with answers soon. So look, I'd really like to express my deep gratitude to Phil Holmes, who generously shared his personal journey with heart valve disease, and to Professor Tom Marwick, who provided expert guidance on how to manage and prevent the condition. Your insights and experiences have been invaluable in helping us to understand heart valve disease and how to live with it well. I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you that it's Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week, which is a wonderful opportunity to raise awareness about this important condition. And remember, it is so important to be heart smart and to speak to your GP about getting your heart checked regularly. Make sure that the, your heart check includes a stethoscope check so that heart murmurs can be detected. Early diagnosis is key to preventing and managing heart valve disease. And while you're downloading your free heart to heart game, please, please sign the petition to government to ensure that stethoscope checks are included as part of the standard heart health checks. So please take care of your heart and we'll see you soon. Thank you for joining.